Welcome to episode 38 of the Serious About Security podcast for May 6, 2013. Brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined this week by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. And Mike will have the first article this week. Thanks, Preston. Uh, the article I have for this week is on uh, Facebook's trusted contacts. On uh, last Thursday, uh, Facebook rolled this out. And uh, trusted contacts is similar to what they had before as trusted friends, but works a, a bit differently. In this case, uh, trusted contacts are um, meant to help you get into your account if you get locked out. So if you cannot remember your password and cannot get into your account, what you can do is um, you can notify Facebook and they will basically contact your trusted contacts and what you, they will receive is a unique code that they then share with you and you have to have a combination of three of those codes to then log into your account. Um, so you can set up multiple trusted contacts. I have not gone through and set it up myself, but I think you have to, you obviously have to set up at least three. I think it might even be five is the minimum number that you may have to set up. Um, but you can set up more than that as well. So the idea is that if you get, uh, like I said, if you get locked out, uh, if you cannot get into your Facebook account, uh, basically Facebook will notify your trusted contacts and uh, they will uh, be able to send you these uh, unique codes, these kind of like one-time codes that are all unique to each of your contacts. And then you have to enter those, each of those codes, at least three of those, to then get back into your account. Um, now I've seen a couple articles discussing this and talking about um, some of the vulnerabilities that could be exploited through this as well. Um, one of the things is you have to, you really want to be careful as far as who you pick to be your trusted contact. Uh, one of the examples I believe was talking about college friends who like to play pranks on each other with their Facebook accounts. So um, maybe if you use them as your trusted contacts, they might see it as an opportunity to uh, collaborate to get into your Facebook account and take it over and post humiliating messages about you or, or pictures you maybe don't want shared. Um, I've also seen a, a little bit of, of criticism in the fact that Facebook already has two-factor and it should be considered the stronger authentication method available and that Facebook maybe should be touting that more than, uh, than this new trusted contacts. Um, personally, I think it's a, a very interesting idea. Um, I think it could be uh, very useful. It, it kind of blends old school and, and new school. Um, some of the analogies I've seen are kind of like giving your house key to a friend or a neighbor. So essentially, you, you want to pick, um, you know, you'd want to pick someone you trust with that kind of uh, uh, level of, of access to your account. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, you want to pick someone, while you might trust them, you also want to pick someone, I guess you would believe, would secure that key as well, that wouldn't be gullible and just give over that key to anybody as well. Um, but I thought this was an interesting article, and I know that, uh, Keith, you helped uh, write a security guide on Facebook security, so I thought this would be a good one for us to discuss today. Right, and we can uh, put a link to that guide uh, in the show notes uh, for people that are interested. But it's the, it was called the Own Your Space, A Guide to Facebook Security. It's actually the official Facebook security guide. And what's interesting is when we wrote that guide, the, pre the precursor to trusted contacts was trusted friends. And that actually was, that came out actually after the security guide was published by a couple weeks uh, or no, wait, let me think about that. I believe it actually came out before the guide was published. It was after we had written it, but before it was actually published, they came out with Trusted Friends. And Trusted Friends went away, oh, about a year later. I think some people are exploiting some problems with the way that worked, and hence, I think, the rename of Trusted Contacts, perhaps. Um, but you're right, Mike, it pretty much works the same as your trusted friends did. You picked three to five, and then if you couldn't get access to your email account, so when it sent you a recovery email with a link that you had to click, you couldn't do that, then it would ask you your security questions, and if you couldn't answer those, then it would say, oh, now you can go contact your trusted friends. 
I believe this works uh, somewhat in a similar manner. I think one thing that might have changed, and I've not confirmed this yet, is that you can no longer select trusted friends when you're stuck. You have to pick your contacts ahead of time, and I don't think you can go back and when you're when you really can't get into your account, say, "Oh, I need to pick some people that can help me, and let me let me look at my list of friends, and I'll pick the ones I want." That was the issue with trusted friends, because people could be uh, fooled into to being friends with fake profiles, and then um, so the attacker would select those comprom or select those fake profiles, and then. Uh, collect the codes that would be sent to them and they could compromise your account that way. I believe that was the big issue with trusted friends. So I'm hoping that trusted contacts does not have that particular problem. Yeah, according to the uh, Facebook release, um, they said that uh, you can now choose and manage your trusted contacts anytime from your security settings instead of only when you're having trouble accessing your account. So I believe as long as you can get to your security settings, you can manage that. Obviously, if you get locked out of your account, you then probably cannot get to your security settings to change that. But Which, yeah, and, and that something. was the issue, like you said. Because if, if you get the point where you're in the bind and you say, oh, i got to pick somebody who can help me, and the attacker can you know, pretend to be you basically and pick the fake profiles, collect the codes and then boom, they've got your account. So you, you really need to set that once when you do your security settings and as you mentioned, Mike, pick the right people um, and then uh, that works a lot better. Well, it sounds to me like uh, before with the trusted friends, this wasn't really an optional thing that I could turn on, uh, turn off per se. When I, if I had trouble, this was an option for me to recover my my account, right? This was an optional. Yeah, I believe if you had not selected trusted friends, you could do it when you were having trouble, and I think that's the big change here. And I think that that's a, a potential problem too. I mean, let's say I'm just I'm a I'm a fairly casual Facebook user, and I don't trust five of my friends, for, for example, I don't have to use the system if I don't want to. Right, and then you would just be, you'd just be having trouble, but if you get to the point where you cannot use trusted contacts, whether you choose to or you just don't feel you can trust people, uh, I think you have some other issues. Um, one of which is, you know, you, it would send you a recovery email. So if you're not keeping track of your email account and you lost access to that account or what, for whatever reason you can't get that email, well, that's problem number one. It's, you know, still, even though we're using Facebook to do a lot of communication, people still need to have an email account somewhere so they can get those recovery emails. And the other part of that was you couldn't answer your security questions. Well, either you didn't do a very good job picking the right questions and, and choosing answers that made sense, or in my case, so I make up complete crap answers and then save the answers so I know what they are, uh, then you're going to have trouble there too. And if you get to that third stage where you're just out of luck, then you've got to rely on people you don't trust. Yeah, this, this may not work for you either. Maybe you shouldn't be on the internet. If that's the if you get into that situation, <laughs> well, one thing uh, Facebook mentioned in their post about it was um, for selecting good trusted contacts. One of their recommendation was uh, choose more people to help you. The more friends you choose, the more people who can help you when you need it. Um, but I, I guess I would really preface that with choose really good friends. You know, if if you only have four good friends that you trust, don't select. Well, the fifth one that you don't necessarily. Right, um, and the other the other thing to keep in mind is I would hope that most Facebook people have at least a couple people that they interact with in the real world that are also on Facebook that they could trust. Absolutely. And, and if you don't have that, you might be uh, psychologically and sociologically impaired. <laughs> well, one of the things it mentions as well. I'm not well, judging. But, I'm just yeah. pointing that out. <laughs> well, it says you can get in touch with your friends um, through phone or in person as well, which really indicates you do know these people. You see them probably on a regular basis. Um, but what's interesting to me is I think uh, what you were alluding to, Keith, is that they need to be 
current, I believe, with their Facebook. You know, so they they're going to get that recovery code sent to them um, through email or, or through maybe Facebook messaging. So they need to be able to access their information on Facebook. They need to have their information current. Uh, if you pick a contact that hasn't been on Facebook for a year and can't get in themselves, uh, might not do you any good. <laughs> They might not be able to help you true, out. True, true. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll share with you who I picked. I picked my wife because I know where she lives. <laughs> and I picked uh, two people down the hall from me who I work with. So it's made very easy. If I get stuck, I can go pound on their doors and say, ha, 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 I can't get into Facebook, by the way. You're going to get a code. I need <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Falling back on that, I've got neighbors across the street and right next door that I interact with a lot. So I'd like to think that I have enough people that I do trust, and I would hope other people could have enough trust in people to do something similar. But hey, we live in a place where you know we're a fairly trusting lot too, and there's not a lot of issues. <laughs> so there's that. We need to try it out for us, Keith. Go well, off your count. <laughs> I think the odd well, thing. I did about that once with trusted friends just to figure out how it worked, and it it was a it was a nightmare of of trying to figure out how to even get to the point where it asked me to go ask my friends for a code. That was tough. I hope it's easier this time. Well, I think the thing about Facebook, which is uh, somewhat unique, is that it's a wealth of information on you and what you're doing and and all that and and uh, you know it's it's a it, it seems like a, a hotbed for fishing essentially and and I and, and I would guess that just if you look if I look at your your page or your friends page or whatever if, assuming I had access I could probably tell who your trusted friends are I mean it, it seems to me like if I just looked over time I could figure out who you probably trusted. Yeah, that's true. You I mean, probably could, but then like, you'd have to compromise their accounts as well. Right. I'd have to compromise their accounts or I'd have to get them to believe that I'm you somehow. I could say, you, true. you know, you might post I'm on vacation in in wherever. You know, on your, well, on your Facebook profile and I could call them and say, "Hey, this is Keith." Uh, trying doing my best to mimic your voice. Well, I'm I'm on vacation in wherever, and I can't access my Facebook account. You know, I, I need that code or whatever. Sure. It just it just seems to me like Facebook is a wealth of just information on you and what you're up to. That is and, and absolutely that. true. So, that is absolutely true. So, so if I wanted to target you, and I somehow was able to view your information via a friend or whatever, then it seems like this is a method that relies on other people that could have a have a have an issue. But I mean, it may yes. with you it may be far off, but for other people it may be a little bit less. Um, no, and effort. and that's a good point. If you picked people that are, I, I guess I'm saying, if you picked five people. You're hoping that the security practices that at least three of those people, three of those people are good enough to prevent somebody from compromising enough and getting access to three codes. Yeah, and I think what Preston's saying is among us as security professionals, that's probably not too difficult a task, but maybe for other folks that's not as easy to, to, to accomplish is... Uh, is um, kind of picking that. You know, one of the things that occurred to me as well is you know, if someone picked, a, picked me as a trusted contact and I got, you know, the message from Facebook that said, here's the code, you know, your friend's trying to get in. And then my, my friend sent me an email and said, hey, man, I'm locked out of Facebook. Uh, can you send me the code they send? I might send something back and say, hey, how, how do you know me, you know? Um, uh, you know, if it was a friend I went to high school with, like, well, what car did I drive in high school, you know, or... Work. Well, if, if you get yeah. to the point like me when you're almost 40 and you're still talking to your high school friends, <laughs> something's probably not right. I'm not saying you can't have high school friends that you're still in touch with. I'm Personal experience, I don't talk to too many of them. Well, yeah. Maybe two. And that was a long time ago. Right. What I'm saying is there's a, you know, um, if you're really worried about 
you know, how, how is it, how do you verify when you get a, a message from Facebook that says, you know, this person has, you know, here's a code you can send to this person, you should share with you this should, person. It, true, and it goes back to who are you going to pick? It's somebody you're in guy. contact with frequently or somebody you haven't seen since high school. Right. Or since third grade <laughs> or whatever. That's why I said, you know, I picked two people down the hall. I picked my wife. <laughs> I would probably pick you two guys because I know where your office is, and I've been yeah. there. You know me. <laughs> we talked on the phone before, and you could still say, well, I, it doesn't really sound like you. When well, did we start working together? You could ask those questions. But so. we could take that example. I mean, that's a good example, Keith, because uh, even so, if, if you sent me an email out of the blue and said, hey, I'm locked out of my Facebook account. You should be getting a recovery code. I'd be like... Prove your Keith, you know. You'd say, call me on the phone call me on and the ask phone. nicely. And you know my number. <laughs> and I know your number, exactly. Yeah. I so have I'm multiple ways of getting in touch with you that do not require Facebook to right. do so. Right, right. But that's just the thing. I would know call it. you on Google+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do a hang, initiate a hangout with initiate all hangout. your trusted contacts. That's say, right. All right. All right. Give, give me, me my code. code now. <laughs> give me my codes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, that works. Yeah. So. A, all right. Well, we'll move on, I guess, to the next article, which is mine, and uh, this is an article by Bruce Schneier that he wrote for uh, CNN, and he basically poses the or makes the argument that more data leads to less security. Uh, and I thought it would be a very interesting discussion point. I mean, this is related to the Boston bombing incident and how the, uh, essentially the um, hindsight bias um, can cloud people's thinking on what we need to do um, and how it's very easy to connect the dots after an incident, but uh, connecting the dots prior to the incident is is very difficult, and and the more data you have, the more dots you have to connect, and uh, that that makes it a lot more difficult if you have more data to connect, you know, an incident and 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 find things out. I mean, he mentions that there's probably a million people that may hit the you know that it may be hit some sort of thing that should they should be interviewed by the FBI but probably 99.999 percent of those are just are are pointless and there's that one that needle in the haystack that you you need to find to 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 prevent something like this and the more data that you that you acquire the more hay you're essentially piling onto this needle so essentially the question I have is do you agree with that? I mean, does do you think more data leads to less security, especially in in something like this, or or uh, is is more data necessary to uh, to find things like this? Well, I think um, having more data makes it more difficult to find things, as you mentioned the needle in the haystack problem. If you make the haystack bigger, it's exponentially harder to find that needle, right? Um, and we do have this hindsight, hindsight bias, like you mentioned, like, oh, after the fact, well, it all made sense, right? But uh, why couldn't we figure this out ahead of time? Um, I mean, until you start looking at a wealth of information that might be available to somebody and then trying to find the likely target the likely method and the likely people involved, uh, you really don't understand that problem very well. You can always go back and say, well, we had all this data and we just didn't know what to do with it, right? I don't think that's necessarily true. And, you know, some of the lot, a lot of the research we have now concerning big data is try to take all the data that we do have and define meaning in it. And that's a work in progress. And we haven't quite figured out how to do that in all cases yet. We can do it with some limited um, some limited things. We have well-structured data, and you can see, you know, we were talking about Facebook earlier. There's certainly a good example of a large amount of data, but what do you mine out of that that makes sense? So I would say that uh, having more data doesn't necessarily make us less secure. I think it, it doesn't help us figure out where the issues are. 
Yeah. Well, and, and I think a real challenge is um, get, being able to understand what is meaningful data up front. Um, it's easy in hindsight to go back and say, well, this, you know, put all the pieces together and say, well, this is meaningful now. But in real time, it may not have appeared to be nearly as meaningful. You know, there's a lot of little things that add up to the overall event. So, I, you know, that's that's the real challenge. And I, you know, um, the only way additional data helps is if it's additional meaningful data. But that's, you know, kind of a chicken and egg thing. You don't really know something's meaningful until something kind of takes place necessarily. Little pieces off of that don't necessarily add up until an event has occurred. Um, so, you know, I think... I think it's a very difficult thing. I'm I'm glad that my job isn't trying to dig through all of that because I think that'd be a very stressful job to have trying to follow all these leads when a lot of them I think uh, you said Preston you know, like 99% of them end up in a dead end or just you know har harmless pieces of data and you're really trying to sh you know sift through all of that just to get to that you know 1% or 0.1% that that is uh, potentially dangerous so. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think more data is going to make it won't make things any more secure necessarily, and it certainly won't make things easier. Well, I, I think you know, I mean, if you once an incident happens, you can look at the data and say, oh yeah, look, we can we can now connect the dots. And and as Bruce Steiner points out, it's like a connect the dot book you have as like a little kid. You know, these dots are numbered. You put them together and get a picture. If you just scatter the dots on a page with no numbers, you know, you, you can make probably uh, hundreds of different pictures using those dots. So it, it, it makes it, with, with the numbers, you know where you're supposed to go. Without the numbers, eh, you, 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 can, you might be able to make the picture you want to make, but you might not be able to. And the more dots makes it more difficult. Um, yeah. And, 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 of course, people are saying we want more data on what exactly happened. But if you get more data on that, you're going to get more data on everything. And the data is just going to be just going to be the same, maybe a bigger needle, but you're also going to have a bigger <laughs> stack to search. So it's, more data is just going to it maybe not make it less secure, but it's not going to make it any more secure, as Keith said. It's just going to you're going to have the same problems with more data. Yep. I think connect the dots is a really poor analogy because when you tell somebody that, they're thinking of the kids drawing, right? You got numbers, you got dots, you connect, you line them all up, and you get a picture. And that is certainly not the case. It's, it, I don't know what a better analogy would be, but that's a, that's a horrible one. I don't think that's very good. We should stop using that, all right? No more. All right, what, what about the needle in the haystack? Is that an okay analogy? That's a little better. I like okay. that one. Okay. That'll work. Well, well, Bruce also mentioned in the article, he said, rather than thinking of it as a simple connected dots picture, think of it as a million unnumbered pictures superimposed on top of each other. I thought we weren't using that analogy anymore, Mike. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, that was said, my instead request. of thinking of it, instead of thinking of it as connected dots, think of it as a million unnumbered pictures superimposed on top of each other. I don't like that one either. You don't like that that, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of still, what I was It's going still involving for, a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think the point is that there's a big push now within the government agencies to collect more, thinking that if you have more, you'll know more. And I don't think that's true. I think if you have more, you'll know less because you, you've got now more work to do, and it's not as easy as just looking at a piece, uh, a piece of data and saying, ah, clearly this is what we need to know. Well, I think if you have more, you'll have more duplicates. You'll have probably essentially the same amount of data as you had before uh, and and no more. I mean, you know, if you have, that, I think that's that's the, 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 the way it works. Is, well, is yeah, and, and not only will you have more, you'll have more questions. And here's, here's an example. So about 10 years ago, whenever I went to the airport to use one of the automated kiosks where you just swipe your credit card or your driver's license or whatever and it would check you in, I could never use that machine. I always had to go to the counter. I could swipe it and it would say, please go see the agent. And so 
after about three or four times, I finally asked the agent behind the desk, you know, why can't I use these machines? It's not just your airline, it's other airlines. I swipe my car and it tells me I gotta go see somebody. And she looks down at her screen and she says, well, that's because you're on a list. <laughs> what list might that be? She had no answer. Uh, she just said, "We it got flagged. We don't know why. You just got flagged and I have to ask you for your ID. Now, I, I, I thought I was a reasonably nice guy. I'm not exactly a terrorist. And, uh, and yet I had this issue for about five years where every time I flew, they had to look me over a little more. Eventually that went away and, and it started working again, I think when they purged the list. But I, to this day, don't know if I was, what list I was on, whether it was a legitimate it, you know, list, why I got on, on it in the first place, and I may never know. But that's a case where, where there's, and if I recall correctly, there was a published figure from the TSA that said their list of people that required further scrutiny was several million. Uh, I don't know that any of those several million in that requires more scrutiny list ever blew up a plane or had any intention to do that, but yet we're on this list and we don't know why. So I don't see that as being helpful data to have. Well, I guess I was on that list once as well, but that was, I know why, how I got put on that list. That was, uh, I had a, I had a flight uh, and we got bumped and they rescheduled, they re-gave us a ticket for a new flight. And if you apparently, if you get a ticket the day before you fly, you are required to go through extra security. So yeah, I never had that issue. And in that, in that case, and there was this little thing on the ticket. There was like this 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 line of S's that basically yep, said yep. you have you have to be scrutinized more at this. Oh yeah, I got checkpoint. they would they would used to handwrite <clears throat> two S's on my ticket at the first guy, or they would circle the S's that were already printed on the ticket, and then I got. My extra, extra pat down and my going through my luggage thing. I always love that. that yeah, we, we we had that once just because we got bumped. So, uh, yeah, that, and we couldn't use the express thing or anything like nope, that. Nope, nope. Yep. Well, you know, two of us at least look yeah, untrustworthy and need further scrutiny. So I feel left out. Sorry, I haven't had that. Haven't had that problem. Well, aren't you lucky? Yeah. Now, now I probably will have it. They're probably listening After to this podcast, now. you're After on the podcast, list. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're now on the list. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else? Does anybody have anything else to add to that? Oh, I could complain longer about airlines and government <laughs> policies, but let's not get into that discussion. Yeah, I think Bruce Schneier has a lot. Of, you can read his articles. He complains a lot about uh, the TSA and all that. So. Uh, but this isn't this isn't related to that really. So anyway, uh, with that we'll uh, we'll end this. Uh, thank you to Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.